So we went over, so I went over in the videos about binary search trees, and you should totally watch those if you haven't gotten the chance to watch. So we're not gonna. So fortunately, though, if you, I've completely become compartmentalized it. So if you haven't watched the video on binary search trees for some reason, guess what? You're not gonna be completely lost during this lecture. Okay, so you don't have to like guiltily stare along and in a panic about not having watched it. Just make sure to watch it because you know you will actually be tested on the material. They they were I tried to like tried to cut them up into fifteen minutes a piece, right? The hardest so and I'll go over the algorithm here because it's been important, but I'm not gonna actually code it up, okay? So because I did that in the video. So here's like binary search tree, right? Um, right. So this is a binary search tree rather than. Is the uh, you know, binary search tree for a, uh, you know, for a bunch of strings, okay? So, right, it's all in alphabetical order. So, right, and the recursive algorithm for searching, this is the same algorithm that was used for add, remove, and delete, right? You, if it was null, you did something if it was null. For contains, you basically return false. Uh, well, for contains, they would return the item. So, compare the value to root.data. If they're equal, then return the value and the root, I return true because I was just trying to say whether true or not it was in there. Otherwise, look to the left. Otherwise, look to the right. Okay. So here, if you're searching for kept, kept is comes comes before lay. It comes after house. K's come after J, so it went after so it goes after Jack. Kept comes before killed, and then we found kept. Right. It's alphabetical order with less than meaning it comes before, greater than meaning it comes after. Right. Right, that's how the compare to method works for strings. Okay, um, how does that work? Well, as we mentioned in the previous things about balancing binary search trees, right? So we're back in chapter six now. Uh, it's generally log n of time. A log n. Or that, or the entire subtrees of those, either. Right. So that's a bunch of stuff we don't have to search. Here, uh, it's actually. Well, there's a pointer because, you know, you can actually pull this up without risking anybody blind, blinding anybody, so that's good. Um, so here, you know, that's log of n time because, remember, how, log of n is how many times can I split this in half, right? So, um, but if it's not very full, then it doesn't really have time to do that. You might end up with a tree in worst case like this where basically everything is just ordered in like a linked list, in which case it's O of n time. That's worst case. Balanced binary search trees will will work that out for you and make sure that that's not an issue. Okay. Um, for adding into a binary search tree, so we're adding Jill into this tree, it was the same thing. We search comes before lay, Jill comes after house, Jill comes after Jack, Jill comes before killed, Jill comes before kept. Oh, we hit our empty, our empty spot, that's where we're going to put our item, right? So I, So adding, remember, was all about just finding the first place we could put something that was in the sorted, or that would keep the tree sorted, right? And then what happens here is that in a self-balancing binary search tree, it will basically see, say, hey, has any of our rules been violated? And if so, if so we're going to try our best to fix the rules and then if, uh, fix it so the rules still apply. And if we can't do that, then maybe we'll rotate something so that it becomes balancing. Okay. Um, so they have the add method. Their add method is pretty much the same as my add method. Um, but what I wanted to go over was the um, removing from a binary search tree. Okay, so I just wanted to repeat. Is I give you a list of numbers and I say, here, pretend you're adding to an empty tree. Add these numbers, you know, show me what happens as we add these numbers to a tree, right? Show me that uh, how that works and you get that exact same problem on the practice exam, only with different numbers. Um, and my, then my remove method is the same just with different numbers on the practice exam and then the actual exam, which is, here's a tree, please remove the, these nodes from it and show me what happens after you remove that from it. So a removing is easy for some, is even easier on some cases, but it's hard for other cases. If you have a leaf, in other words, if you have a node with no children, you can just remove, as I explained in the video, you can just snip it off the tree. No problem, you just remove that node and it's gone, um, okay? Um, so that was so easy. So that one's so easy they don't even bother going over it. This second case, if the tree to remove has only one child, in other words, it doesn't have two. It's not a leaf, but it only has one child, right? 
uh, you just change the reference so that basically the grandparent adopts the child. So here, if we were to remove is, in this case, we're removing is here. It might be hard to see, but we're removing is and in was its child. Well, what happens? Well, Jack adopts in as its child. So basically, you get replaced by your child if you have one child. Okay? And everything stays in order. So for removing two children, there was this whole thing about, I did about, like, okay, what do we remove? Well, none of these work. Well, you can use either the in-order predecessor or the in-order success in order successor to do the removal, okay? So if an item to be, uh, if you want to remove an item and replace it that has two children, you find it's in order pre predecessor or it's in order successor. I always do the in order predecessor, which simply means, you know, if I were to print out this entire tree in order, then it'd be the one right before it, okay? So, and I explain, how do I find that guy? That sounds like a bit of a, so if I were to delete house, Right, I'm replacing it with horn. Right, if I'm cleaving house, I'm replacing it with horn. Well, how did I figure out what that is? Well, the in order predecessor is always the biggest item in my left subtree. Okay, this is what I explained in the video. It's always the biggest item in the left subtree. How do I find that? Well, I step into my left subtree, so I go one to the left, and I then I got it. How do I find the biggest item in that subtree? Well, the biggest item is going to be bigger than everything, so it's going to be to the right, and it's going to be right of that, and then to the right of that. So, so you go. So you basically just zig and then zag hard as possible. So you go one to the left, and then you go all the way to the right, and that's your in-order predecessor. How do I know? Well, consider what if there was guy to, what if it was to the left? Well, then it'd be less than something. It wouldn't be the biggest thing by by definition if it went to the left. What about if uh, if I if I find my in-order predecessor, but it has something to the right of it? Well, then it's not your in-order predecessor because that guy to the right is even bigger. That's the in-order predecessor, right? So you go all the way to the right. And so one to the left, all the way to the right. And there's just a bit of, and the coding is a bit complicated with that because you have to just have this current on next loop. But abstractly, it's really easy. You go one to the left, all the way to the right, and you found your, and you found, and you just simply replace it. So here we are deleting house. We went one to the left, all the way to the right. We found horn, so we replaced horn. What happens in the code is that, what happens is that basically I copied the data over here and then I delete this guy, right? Um, Okay, so over here uh, we did re we're deleting a uh, rat, and we're and so we went one to the left, all the way to the right. We found priest was the biggest thing in there, but priest had a child, mourn. Okay, well, um, when you're so the guy you're replacing him with, so if you so if you're when you're deleting a node, the guy who's replacing him, he's either going to have no children, in which case no problem, you just replace him, or he's going to have one child. He's not going to have two because if he had two, right? You could go one more to the right. So he's only ever going to have one. So um, so he has only one child. In this case, he has more. It's his left child. But we, but in a sense, we're deleting priest, right? We're deleting priest, and we're copying the data from priest over here. So that way this reduces to is that we just copy the data over here, and now we reduce this to how do I delete priest from this tree? Well, we're deleting a single a node with a single child, right? That's an easy case. We just simply adopt, we just simply have milk adopt more. That makes sense to everybody? So basic, yes? Why did Priest? Why Priest? Why did Priest get to replace Rat Be instead of like? Any of the other guys? Yeah. Because you wanted to go, because we're in replacing him back with the in order predecessor, which means to find it is the biggest thing in the left subtree. So that means all the way to one, one to the left, all the way to the right. If we were doing the in order successor, it would be one to the right. And all the way to the left, so we could have replaced it by shaven. We could have replaced the the rat with shaven, which would make made the rat very unhappy, I'm sure. Um, so, um, and yeah, so it, it ends up being this kind of not me. It looks like a monstrous thing, but it's like, oh, if the local root has no children, if the local root has one child, else I have two children. In which case, that's it's only that case which is where it becomes a bit monstrous. But that's how you um, add and delete. So you're going to get the opportunity to write your own add and delete methods. Uh, the good news is that basically it doesn't require is that you can pretty much adapt the code I have to do your job for you. It's a matter of okay, you saw concept A, here's concept B. Can you just translate the? Can you do a pretty effortless translation to turn A into B? Essentially, it's not as it's it. Again, it's one of those. It's one of those. My patented projects where it seems harder than it is, or I just find homework assignments where from 
that somebody else did. And I go, oh, I'll change this slightly, and then I'm going to make it slightly uh, harder uh, and slightly easier in some ways. So it's going to look harder than it is, just like anything else I do. Okay, so we're going to now learn about. So now here we're going to learn about completely different data structure, but it's still a tree. In fact, it's still going to be a binary tree. Uh, we're going to learn about heaps and priority queues. All right. So, um, so remember how we learned all those terrible definitions that I suppose I have to rewind and remind you about because it's been like a whole week, like a whole two weeks, right? Right. So zooming back here, uh, all the way back. Tree terminology. Nope, too far. There we go. Full, perfect, and complete binary trees. Okay, so we went over what a full tree is, and that was like, I've got to have both, I have to be, all the nodes have either two children or no children, right? And then we had perfect, which was kind of like, it makes sense that that's perfect, right? It's, it's basically, it's completely balanced, everything's all filled up, right? It's nice and aesthetically pleasing. So the complete was the really odd one out, which basically it said it was complete up to this level, but the bottom level, everything had to be moved over to the right, sorry, over to the left, all the nodes were towards the left, so this is a complete binary tree, and I went over an example saying, hey, this is a binary, this is a complete tree, but this one with a gap isn't. Does that ring a bell to everybody? Okay, so so the reason we do with complete trees is because all heaps are complete trees. Okay? So let's go and look at an example. So a heap is a complete binary tree, but notice that it looks a bit different, right? It's not sorted, right? At least not in the way that you that we normally did. It's still sorted, just in a bit of a different way, for a different purpose. Okay, so in a heap, the smallest value is right here, the root. Okay, and furthermore, each heap below it is the root of its own heap. Okay, so every not every non-empty subtree is a heap. So look at numbers uh, at six over here. Then look, let's just examine this tree over here. This guy is the smallest value in his subtree. Eighteen is the smallest value in his own subtree. Right, 18 is smaller than 20 and 28, also 37, 26, 30, 76, and 32, right? Looking at 20, it's the smallest value of 20, 37, and 26. 28 is the smallest value of 72 and 32, right? 29 is the smallest value of, of this subtree over here. It's not the smallest value of all these, right? 18 is smaller than 29, right? But it's just... It's even easier to keep in order than a, than tree is, right? It's just simply the smallest values on top, and my children are both heaps. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. The last one. Is, uh, the last slot. Well, the last one is the biggest. It, it, it is the smallest item, right? Um. So does it? Does the order matter? No. I could put twenty nine where it, I could move. Uh, I could swap. So this could be the left tree. Left and rights don't matter in this case. Okay, all that matters is is am I the biggest guy, right? So am I the smallest guy in um in the tree? So this is specific. Yes. Um, what if we want to add like seven? Seven? That's an excellent question. We will have to uh, reheapify it. Well, um, which will take login time, but you'll see. But we do add and remove stuff to the heap. Okay, so you're on you're on the right track with that. Um, the big thing I wanted to point. Out here uh, was that this is uh, what we call a min heap. Okay, almost derailed my train of thought there. So this is what we call a min heap. A min heap, uh, as you might uh, gather, deals with the smallest stuff. There is also a max heap, which we'll learn for heap sort, which uses the heap, and that deals. And instead of the smallest item being at the root, the max heap has the biggest item in the root. That makes sense, right? So it's a complete binary tree with the following properties. So how do we add, so this is a data structure, so we're going to, so really what we care about is adding and removing from the heap. Then we're going to use actually heap to build a different data structure called a priority queue, which is a queue where people get to cut in line because they're more important than, than something else. Where so the lower your number, the more important you are. Well, so you're number one, so you get to be in the front, right, is kind of the idea. Okay, so, um, and this is useful, and why is this useful? Because like for queues, right, we were, when we were talking about queues, uh, you know, a queue might not be great. A queue is great for like, you know, getting in line, but if you're in a hospital situation where the nurses are doing triage, well, the guy who's coming in with a head injury or is complaining of heart problems should probably be seen before the guys with the broken arms, right? Because those guys are more likely to die without any medical intervention. 
So in that case, the nurses use, uh, the, the medical system pretty much uses what's called a priority queue, or what well, they won't call it a priority queue, but we call it a priority queue, where they basically see the, the, the next patient gets to see the, uh, the who gets, sorry, the next patient who gets to see the doctor is the one who's in the most dire straits, okay? That's the point of triage. Uh, basically, so yeah, you're gonna have to wait uh, wait a lot, bunch of hours for, for that broken finger of yours, which is terrible, but that's because there's worse, they believe it or not, they are worse people for shape, unfortunately. Um, so, okay, so how do I insert a new item into the heap? Well, you put it, you, you put the new item pretty much into the next open slot in the heap that would keep it complete, which means you put it into the next rightmost slot. So, right, we didn't have, uh, so we didn't have 89 here before, right? It's the same heap, actually, believe it or not, on this page, because it's on this page. So we didn't have 89 before, and now we're inserting 89. So we're not going to put it here, we're not going to put it here or here, because putting those there, um, actually, let's, let's, let's create a pen. So, um, can you do that? Yay, let's create a pen. So I'm not going to put it here or here, right? Because if I put it here or here, that would make the tree, that, that would leave a gap over here, right? Which would mean the tree would no longer be complete. It goes here because that, because we had 37, 26, seven, uh, 76, 32, 74. So the next open slot was here. It has nothing to do with the values, right? It has everything to do with the positioning. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and can I raise all the ink? Nice. Okay. So, uh, so, to, so that's just simply the easy part. Just to simply insert it the, into the next position at the bottom of the heap. And then, uh, while the new item is not the root, and the new item is smaller than its parent, you swap it with its parent. So we'll go into that in detail in the next one, right? But it's actually a very easy algorithm. So let's say we insert eight next, okay? Well, just like you said, or, or like you guessed, it's like, if you add a node to this thing, how do we keep this in order, right? So it's actually a really easy algorithm. Am I smaller than my parent? Yes, I am. Swap it with my swap. I'll swap it with my parent. Am I smaller with my pa than my parent? Yes, I am. Swap with my parent. Am I smaller than my parent? No. So I'm done. That's all you have to do, so long as you, as long, long as you had a heap to begin with, which is really great. Uh, how long does that take? Uh, that's going to take log n time because uh, this is right. This is a tree, right? And this is going to take at most a height number of steps, right? So it's going to take one step here, one step here, one step here, and one step here. That's four steps at most. And this is going to have at most 15, let's call that 16 to make the math easy, okay? Even though it's not going to be 16. So log base two of 16 is four, right? So we're, it's going to be basically the height of the tree, which is, okay. So how do I remove these things? Well, it turns out that, that with these heaps, yeah, you only add from to one place in the tree, which is one, which is the next empty spot. Uh, for removal, you only remove you only ever remove one item from the heap, okay, and that's the root. So you only ever remove the heap of the tree. Sorry, the the, the root of the heap. So, um, the, so what we do with the what we so here, how do we remove the the heap? Well, first thing, sorry, how do we remove the root of the heap? Well, the first thing we do is we, we return it to the user. So we'll return, when we're removing it, we'll, we'll go ahead and store six for later use, okay? And then we cross it off. And instead, what we're going to replace is that we're going to replace it with the, uh, we're going to replace it with the last item in the heap, which is 66 right over here, right? That's the last item in the heap. So uh, 66 will become the new root tem temporarily. Okay, so they'll do, well, let me do an, it'll do animations in just a second for you. So, see, we're going to remove, we only ever, when we remove from it, just like when, with the stack and just like a queue, you can only pop from the top and you can only remove the front of the queue. So you can only remove the top of the heap, right? If you imagine a heap of clothing, you really only want to deal with the topmost layer of that first, okay? So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to move the bottommost thing and replace it on top, okay? And now we go on a very similar process, which is that, uh, the tree is now possibly, the heap's now possibly out of order, so now we push it down, right? It's a heavier item, so it's going to sink to the bottom. Just like with this thing over here, a, uh, 8 was smaller, it was lighter, so it's going to, so it bubbled to the top. It bubbled as far as it could. Right? 
here, 66 is, a he is pretty heavy, so it's going to sink as far as it can. Well, which direction should, sh should it sink? 18 or 8? Well, 8 is smaller, so it's going to swap with 8. Make sense? So 8 will bubble up, while 66 bubbles down. 66 is bigger than 39 and 29. 29 should bubble up. So we've hit sediment, right? We've hit null with our, he with our very heavy, heavy 66. So we stay there. Make sense? So um, now because it's a complete binary tree, this is the really cool thing about this. So we've been dealing with linked data structures for a while. We almost completely forgot that we can build stuff with arrays. But pretty much everything, I think for basically the next couple of data structures, we're going to be using arrays to build stuff. Uh, so heaps, you can build them using arrays rather than a linked data structure. And you might be going, how? Okay, this is obviously going to be a pain in the butt, right? Well, actually, it turns out, no. Uh, you just simply read left to right from top to bottom. So 8 goes into index 0, then his children, then their children, and then their children. And that's how you represent it as an array. So um, what's really cool is that, so you might be going, okay, that seems pretty arbitrary, but it's not. It actually has a formula, which is like when I found it out, it was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And then I realized I was a huge nerd because I thought that was cool. So, um, so, um, so okay, so if you're at position P, then your left child is at uh, twice your index plus one, and your left child's right next to him at twice your index plus two. So for zero, that's pretty obvious. It's at one, your ch zero children are at one and two, right? Because you're at index zero, so this 2P doesn't matter. Right, so you're at one and two. Well, what about like for index twenty, uh, index three, which is this guy over here, right? Twenty. Um, well, he's index three, so his child should be at uh, six plus one, so that's seven, and six plus two, which is eight. Cool. So and and so we see this data structure over here, right? This is our, the abstraction we, so this is an abstraction, and I like working with this guy, especially when I'm drawing this kind of thing, but when it comes to the coding, on the, you know, when we open up the hood of the car, so to speak, this is what's going on underneath the hood. We're going to be using the formula to figure out who's my parent and who's my child. Um, so, okay. um, so, right, so let's look at another case, uh, index 2, right, that's 29, his children are 39 and 66. And they're at five and six, which matters, sorry, which uh, makes sense because two times two plus one, that's five. Two times two plus two, that's six. So we can use this formula to find a parent, use a parent, you know, given an index, I can find my children. Um, and then, well, sorry, went forward. Well, obviously for 10, his children, if he has them, they'll be at indices 21 and 22, which don't exist here. So 32's children, this guy over here, they'll be at uh, 21 and 22, which makes sense because this guy would be uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Right, if you follow the little bit, that's not there. So I'm giving the best choice there. Um, all right, so what about the other way around? Well, thanks to the wonders of integer arithmetic, which means we throw out which means we always round down, okay? Uh, you, a child can find its parent by subtracting one from it and dividing by two. So 74, its parent is at, uh, is at well, 11 minus one, so that's 10, divide by two, give me five. That's pretty nice to find. So, uh, so if I'm in, so if we can use an array list, by the way, on the back end to make sure that it resizes as necessary rather than an array, you just simply, Add it to table dot size minus one, and then, uh, then how does it work? So this is how it works on the back end. How it would actually work in code. Now I'm not actually going to code this up. This might actually seem like a great thing to do. The coding this seems like a great exercise for say a time lab or something. So you know, because you know, given this stuff, just complete the functions for this. Okay. Um, so insert the new element at the end of the array list and set child. Yes. I have no idea. I would let you have to let you know. Okay, but it would probably be array based if that's your question, right? Because I'm talking about array based stuff right over here. Okay, so um, what am I? So what I'll do is I'll insert into the last as side in the list, right? Say I'm adding eight. So 
now I got to figure out, do I need to swap, right? So I figure out what my parent is. So I subtract one from my index. So I subtract one from uh, 13 to get 12, divide by two, that's six, right? Awesome, and so the computer agrees with me, so that's nice. Okay, so while my parent is a valid index, right, while my parent is greater than or equal to zero, in other words, while my parent is greater than a valid index, and my, uh, my parent is bigger than me, I'll swap with my parent, boom. And I'll set child equal to parents. So in other words, I'm now at this location, and now I find where my parent is. Right? I'm still the child, but I, so i got to find my new parent. Set parent equal to child minus one divided by two. Okay, so I, I'm now I'm at six now, so subtract one, that gives me five, divide by two, that gives me two. Five divided by two is equal to two, but only in this crazy classroom, you know, where, where we ignore floating points. Um, so am I smaller than my parent? Yes, I am. So I'll swap, uh, update my index, find out what my, the index of my new parent is. So that's two minus one, which is one, divided by two, uh, two. One divided by two is against all reason, zero. So, um, so it is now, so I found my parent and, and, is, and he turns out to be bigger than me. So I'm going to stop, sorry, smaller than me. So I'm going to stop. So it's a pretty nice algorithm over there. It's fairly straight. So that's a pretty nice algorithm for, for, for that. For removing, it's this, you remove the, uh, it's very similar. Um, I'll, let's see, I'm just gonna go ahead and, yeah, I'll go ahead and put, uh, do it on the board since they didn't, weren't kind enough to put one over here. Exactly. No, these classrooms are supposed to have them anyway, but they don't. So you've you've got one. Oh. Well, that's okay. So imp I can I can always improvise. Um, very poorly, I'm sure. So um, yeah, why don't we go back to this to this table? I can improvise over here. Okay. Why not? Um, but of course, you need to be able to see that. So, um, let's see. I'm going to use purple ink because I like that color. Okay. So, uh, let's say. So, for removing an item, right? Uh, what item gets removed? Yep, eight. The root always, always gets removed. Where are we going to replace it with? Right. We replace it with this guy because he's the sm because he's the small. So I'm going to just cross him out. Um, it's a nice cross out a bit on 89 on 74, but whatever. Okay. So. Put 89 up there for right now. Okay. Yes. Oh, that was finding. Oh, that was back in trees. Um, that was for uh, for that was finding the next in order process. Okay. So um, when I'm removing the root here, right, I replace it with my. When I remove the root of the heat, I just remove it and I replace it with the item here on the bottom. Now, 89 is pretty heavy, so he needs to sink pretty far. So I check him against his children, uh, 18 and 29. Okay, uh, so 18 versus, so this is bigger than both of them. So what should I swap him with? The smallest. So 18 will go over here. He's going to be the new root. 18 is going to be the new root. Okay, so 18 is over here, and now 89 is over here. Okay, so... 89 versus 20 and 28. So yeah, we swap with 20 because he's bigger than both of them, but we want to swap with our smallest child. So 20 ends up going over here, okay? And now 89 goes over here. It ends up being that 89 also happens to be smaller than both those, so we swap with 26 in this case, right? Because 26 is the smallest child. Six. So 89 goes over here. Okay. So now our tree looks. So now our our RA is becoming more along the lines of 18, 20. Okay. 29 is still in the same place. Uh, 26 is over over here in over here. Then 28. That's a terrible 26. I should have been a doctor, like a medical doctor. My handwriting's. Apropos for it. So 39, 66, 
uh, 37, then 89 over here, 76, 32, and then 74, which was just smeared over because I've got a bit vigorous with the uh, crossing it out. And then uh, this guy doesn't actually exist anymore, right? 12 got removed, or index 12 got removed. So it reorders a uh, four items because uh, at most. So how, and that makes sense because the height of the tree is four. So that makes sense that four items will probably be in affected by this. So uh, how well does this perform? Well, insert, that will be going, well, we're bubbling up the insert with insert, right? We're going from the bottom to the top with insert. So, uh, if the height, so that's going to take H, that's where H is the height of the tree. Um, remove, that's going to take something from the bottom, put it at the top, and, top, and then that's going to fall all the way to the bottom, right? So that's going to be required at most H steps as well, with the height of the tree. And the height of the tree is, is it's logarithmic, right? That's, that's, that's related to, to the log of the however many items you have in the tree. So it's log n time, right? Right. Based on what we know from our binary search trees, this takes log n time because the most on a binary search tree it takes for an ad is to go from the root all the way to the bottom to find the item you need to go to. And same thing for a remove operation. Um, you got you need to find the item, and worst case scenario, you don't find it because you hit a dead end. So it takes log n to do those. So the heap in itself is used to make the queue, or the, what we call priority queue. So heap is used to implement a priority queue. Um, and as I mentioned, that with the, and I already mentioned why we wanted that, because sometimes it's important for people to cut in front of each other. Um, right? In a printing queue, like for their printing queue example, remember that all the way, all the way of a couple weeks ago. So um, for, uh, sometimes in your printing queue, sometimes if somebody's trying to pay uh, print, like, if there's like a 300 page document queued and you come after it and you just want like one page, it makes sense that the printer policy is to print the one page before the 300 page document, right? Just, just order it so that the slowest, so basically the least amount of time spent waiting as possible is done. So here you might have a web page and you've got a four page history pa paper and then the three page cuts in front of the four page history paper and then another one page cuts in front of the uh, three-page paper, but it goes behind the original paper that was already there because it's already there. Okay, so it's very useful for building stuff if you want to cut in front, of, if you wanted to cut in front of other people. Otherwise, priority queue is exactly the same as a queue. You, you, uh, you, you, end queue items and you dequeue items from it, right? You don't go searching through it. You just let the queue automatically order stuff in it for you. But rather than being a constant time operation, and they're log time. That's so close to constant, it's fantastic. Okay, so um, honestly, this other stuff doesn't really matter too much. So now, so yeah, I am really not liking the fact that I thought I had a dry erase marker. So um, my bag, apparently not. And it doesn't have one. Does anybody have one? Napkins, which is the opposite of what I want. It's like literally the opposite. I mean, um, actually, I'll be right back. I'm going to check another room. Add the, all these items to a heap, right? So I give you a bunch of numbers and I tell them, you to add them into a heap. 
and then I tell you to remove two items from what you built. And each of those is like worth six or seven points. And you'd be, and, uh, you'd be surprised how many people get that wrong, like completely and utterly. Like they forget the most basic fact of a tree, so I get to mark it wrong automatically. And the most basic fact is, is that, uh, well, sorry, forget the most basic fact about heaps, which is that heaps need to be complete binary trees, and their heaps look like little jagged trees rather than these complete trees. So don't do, don't be that student, don't do that, right? It's going to be the people who do that are traditionally the people who don't show up to class. Uh, so don't be that person. Um, the other thing that students for some reason find very hard, and I find, I don't know why I find this stuff easy, but it's fun. Uh, this is actually completely different, and it's exciting, and it's really interesting, uh, and it talks about, uh, because right now we're going to talk about, you know, an actual application, which is compression, okay? And by compression, I mean, like, uh... That means, I mean, like, going over here, going over to a, you know, a folder I have, right? And me going to this and saying, hey, I want to add this to an archive, turn it into like a zip file, and I'd like to compress it, okay? And turn it into something that's probably smaller. So this said it was, uh, it was, you know, this many kilobytes, and this one is, says it's 102. So reduce this about by 10 kilobytes. This is compression, right? Now there's two types of compression, okay? Compression, that's the ability to just make files smaller, okay? Which is pretty nice because your disk, your disk, your disk space is limited, okay? Um, in fact, like the entire thing about, uh, there's an entire TV show these days based on compression, Silicon Valley. The entire premise of that is that they create an amazing compression algorithm, and that's great because now all the data files we send to your phone are very much smaller, right? That's the entire premise of the show, other than, you know, drama and making fun of, you know, the entire culture of Silicon Valley. Um, kind of the ha-ha, it's funny because it's true kind of humor in there um, is quite prominent. So, um, the, um, so there's two types of compression that go, that go on, okay? The first type is what you will typically find in, um, in files that you traditionally use to consume media, which is uh, lossy compression. So MP3s, Right, uh, MP4 files, um, AVIs, MKB files. Those are all forms of. I think MKB is a lossy compression. Those are all forms of what we call lossy compressions, um, and that means that basically when we compress something, we throw throw away a bit of the data. Like uh, for instance, for audio files, right? Humans don't really hear too much about 20,000 hertz. So anything that we pick up with a with a signal. Uh, any, anything that's above 20,000 hertz, you can just throw that out if you want to listen to music because you're not going to be hearing that anyway, so why keep that data around, okay? Uh, similarly, you might, uh, you know, we, we found that basically, that basically you can only, there's a certain rate, you know, like, uh, so a movie, that's basically a bunch of, frank, of pictures just ordered one after another, okay, right? That's how film works, we just simply, you know, show one picture, then another, and another, and that was just simply coordinated with music, okay? How many of those does it take to be a good movie, right? Or just to make it, uh, to make it tolerable? Well, you don't want, like, two frames per second. That means you're seeing a different picture every half second, okay? So that's not that great. Uh, most modern cinema for cost uh, is based off of old cinema, which for cost purposes, I believe, used, like, 24 frames per second, or maybe 22. Um, but you know you can see well above that. So like um, so if you if you play on if, so if you're at like a store like an, uh, like uh, some, if you go like Micro Center or something okay where they've got like lots of monitors on display check out the difference between a 60 hertz monitor and a 144 hertz monitor and it is astounding basically the difference basically of how many frames per second it shows you okay it's a lot smoother right. Um, typically, your laptop uh, screens will run at 59 or 60 hertz per second. And that's typically, that's basically, that means it will show you about 60 images per second. But above a certain threshold, right, we can see more than that. We can, see, we can tell the difference between 60 hertz and 144. Hertz. But at some threshold, we can't see above that. So at that threshold, it's safe to throw everything out. Or if we're just doing this for, or if it's a movie, right, that was filmed at, at, uh, at, one, at 20, you know, 22 frames per second, 22 hertz. 
then it makes sense to throw out any extra stuff that we don't need. We don't. We only need to show so many frames per second. So loss of compression means we can throw it out. Yeah, I went on a huge diatribe around there, but I find it helps students understand like the applications. And, right. This is a question. So this is a question of how to apply this stuff to. Um, so compression is big because making files smaller and yet usable is always a great uh, thing. Um, right now, our, our algorithms for compressing files are great at making the files small and having a lot of detail, except when you get stuff like fireworks going on. And then, so if you ever watch a video of fireworks or a live stream of fireworks, it always goes like kind of, blip, you know, you get this like uh, weird, you know, square effect sometimes on the video where it just doesn't seem to keep up with the fireworks, right? That's because the just the out, way the algorithm works it just can't handle those. Um, okay, so that's lossy compression. What we're concerned about, though, is like when I'm dealing with uh, sending a file to, to, um, so say I'm a student, I'm sending a file to my professor because I'm turning it in, right? Like a Word document. I don't want a lossy compression algorithm. I don't want. Uh, to send him a file and then it be missing like every third word. That probably won't be very good for my grade. I want an algorithm, if I'm zipping it up, to be something, to, I want it to show me like something that's a, uh, I want it to be lost less is the term. I don't want it to be lacking anything. So when I go over here to uh, unzip this file, right, it, it says, hey, this is the same file you already have over here. Okay. Okay. Um, so we want to talk about basically how can I make things smaller? How can I make files smaller and make them take up less space? Specifically, we're going to be dealing with text files because most of the time when you compress uh, uh, documents, you don't want to be losing any of the valuable text information inside of it. Okay? So in order to understand that, we have to understand how ASCII works. Because we're going to be dealing with ASCII, even though that ASCII is a lie. And we don't really use ASCII so much. The question is, what is ASCII, right? And then we also we use UTF-8. What the heck is UTF-8, right? The question about UTF-8 is, don't worry about it, but it's the way that we can uh, that when I send you like an emoji that you're you're and from an Android computer and from sorry an Android phone to an iPhone, your iPhone knows how to render that emoji as a specific character, right? Um, and it knows basically it's the way of saying how how computers know A is A and what bits beats what bit sequence is A, what beat, bit sequence is B, and so on and so forth. So um, ASCII, they go over Unicode, but also use UTF-8 at this point. So ASCII is this table over here. It's easier to deal with than Unicode, so we're gonna just simply use that for all practical purposes. ASCII table, sure. Okay, so um, if you remember a car is essentially an integer, but it renders as a letter. Okay, uh, here's our ASCII table. Uh, so, so essentially, consider we have uh, eight bits, okay? So we assign every single bit a specific sequence, right, is the idea. Um, so the zero, so, and then every, and so every byte is, is a letter or a character. So if I see uh, the bit sequence that adds up to 64, so if I see, a 64 and a 1, right, that adds up to 65, then I know that that byte represents a capital A. And if I see a 97, that is a lowercase a, right? This is how text is represented. Yeah, sorry, this is how text is represented, right? It's a, it's a, does that make sense to everybody, right? It's, um, okay, I mean, let's just go over for a second. I'm going to grab one of the things from 1068 and use it, um, right? Um, so car C, right, is equal to 87, okay, uh, sorry, 97, and now if I do uh, print C, right, if I print C, it's going to print A, character C is A, right, because the, because the big combination that represented 97, the computer knows to represent that as A, okay. If I were to put in um, 102, it's going to represent that as um, F, which matches up with the table we have over here, right? Um, and some computers, if they've got a bell on their um, compute on, on their motherboard, uh, you can make them make noise with seven. 
Uh, right? Yes. Oh, excellent question. Well, so ASCII only goes up to 127, seven bits. Uh, and then basically what, ha what happened is that basically internally each company or each country could use a different, uh, use the rest of the 128 bits that they would like, however they like, which as you mentioned, led to a lot of problems, especially in countries that went, well, actually our, uh, our languages use like thousands of characters, you know, say basically most of the Asian languages. So, um, so that, that led up to be a bit of a problem. So, yeah. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we have something like unicode. Uh, but to answer your question, if I do uh, 73, uh, sorry, 732, because this is an UTF-8, this will actually render as something. Uh, and that looks to be like a tilde character that would go over another one. So if I were, so very uninteresting. If I were to do 700, I don't know like any of these off, off my own. But it's another weird punctuation character. Okay, so that's a bit more of an interesting, that's something used in a different, in an alphabet other than pure English, okay? So um, that's all very well and good, but that means that basically we use eight bits per character if we're doing ASCII, one byte per character if we're doing ASCII, okay? Um, and if we're using pure Unicode, that would be uh, 32 bits per character um, or something. But um, the idea here, equal in the English language, right? If we look, if we were to take all, if you were to ignore capitalization and, take, and just look at the English language, uh, some characters appear more than others. What is the most common character in the English language? Wrong. Yes, I know, it is, it is the most common letter, but it's not the most common character. Space, it's up there on the screen. Yeah, I know, I know, I just look, I, I, I love that students jump at E, and I'm sorry, I, I pick on you a lot, I'm sorry. So, but it is, the most common letter is E, that's completely correct. The most common character is space. And think about it, every single word will have a space after it, except for the ones that have a period, and those will have a space after the period. So that's the most common character in the English alphabet. So that happens a lot, and that still costs eight bits. Um, E's cost eight bits, even though they'll happen a heck of a lot more than the J, the Q, the X, or the Z. Or the Z. Uh, this is a frequency table, and it says that E's will appear 103 times more frequently than the J, the Q, the X, or the Z, right? This is kind of fingerprint for the English language. Basically, if I took the dictionary and ran, and ran it through, this, I'd get something approximating this. Basically, a K appears five times more than J. Uh, G appears 15 times more than Z, right? So, um, so this is used, this is a frequency table. And the idea behind uh, this kind of compression is, why don't we assign, rather than, rather than having, sorry, rather than having them all cost eight bits, Okay, rather than having them call all costs a whole byte, right? Why don't I just make some of them cheaper than the others? Why don't I do like three bit combinations for some of these guys and like these guys who never show up, I'll make them more expensive, maybe make them cost 11 bits, okay? Um, so, what you, so what we do is we build something like this and we use it to decode, use it to decode the language. Um, so, appeared all the way at the beginning. I don't know why they do it at the beginning because it looks really confusing at the beginning. But a Huffman tree, it represents Huffman codes for characters that might appear in a text file. So as opposed to ASCII or Unicode, Huffman codes use different numbers of bits rather than uh, to encode letters. And more common characters use fewer bits. So rather than everything being equal and taking up the same amount of space, more common characters take up less space and less common characters take up more space. Uh, and so a lot of Programs will use Huffman coding to compress them. So, um, so for here, um, we'll encode E using 0, 1, 0. Okay? Uh, and we'll code D using uh, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. So, 0 is to the left, 1 is to the right. Okay? So, we'll build this thing to basically know how we can encode things. So, Z's only, so E's only take 3 bits as opposed to 8. And the Z's take one, two, three, four, five, sorry, so five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten bits, right? So two more bits than eight, but they appear so uh, uh, infrequently, it's okay to do that, okay? So going all the way back to where things actually occur, okay? Okay. So, um, 
So this is a frequency table for the entire English language. Now we're going to have to learn how to do this for ourselves because that's not necessarily the most important, the most, uh, for any given file, it's not necessarily the greatest way to compress anything. What if we're working with something that's using just the Cyrillic alphabet, for example, or the Greek alphabet, right? That would require a different frequency chart because that because I don't know if E is the most char common character in the Greek alphabet, probably or most common letter, probably not. Space is still probably the most common character though. Um, so the idea is that maybe we want, or and in English that might not that frequency table isn't always true. Um, for instance. Uh, you know, people got really bored in the 19th century. Uh, so a uh, novel without E, right? Even Gatsby, that's what it would uh, be. Uh, 1939 uh, novel by Vin or Ernest Vincent Wright, as if there weren't enough going on in 1939, okay? Does not include the letter E, okay? So, it so, so it's about a dying fictional city of Branton Hills, which is revitalized by the efforts of the protagonist, John Gatsby, knows the lack of E's in his name, Okay, and the youth group he organizes. That's the lack of E in the youth group, right? So uh, it is 50,000 words. It does not have anything that has E. So it is, he says that the primary difficulty was avoiding the ED suff suffix for past tense verb. So he didn't walk there, he did walk. Okay, so it just required some creative creativity on his part. Um, but it's an entire novel, okay, without the letter E which means that this uh, nice table that we went and looked at, right, is completely invalid, right? Maybe prop is A the most common character now, right? Because now some, so because vowels are super common and, uh, or is it I because he had to use the word did so much? Or does it make it D because did was used a whole lot and there's two, you know, Ds in every did, okay? So, um, so question is how do we build these things? Okay, and then also importantly, how do I use these things? Okay, so uh, for this, so let's go over how to use these things first. So if I wanted to encode the, uh, the, the, the uh, message hi, okay, I would look to the, basically I basically have to figure out what the character combination for uh, H is, okay? So that's zero, 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 one, so zero, so I'll encode <laughs> all that effort for nothing. And it worked on the other thing too, or is it because that this is like sprayed on or something? Um, okay, so zero, 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 one, okay? So zero, 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 yeah, one, so, okay? So that's H, and then another, so high is I, so that's a zero, a one, a one, and a zero. Zero one one zero. Okay, and then basically instead of sending the ASCII codes for that, I'll send zero 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 one zero one one zero. Okay, and then they'll use their own corresponding tape, and I'll also have to send this table as well so they can decode it. And right, so there's a size requirement for this table as well. So this we probably don't want to use this to send just two characters because this table's bigger than those just those two characters, right? But for example, what they'll do is that they'll they'll have their table, right, which they'll use to build this tree, and they'll have this message, and they'll go, okay, so I see a zero, so I go to the left, I see a zero, I see a zero, I see a one, I hit a leaf. Notice how only the, le the letters are only in leaves, by the way, okay? So I said, okay, we went zero, zero, I went left, 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 right, down to an H, so now I'm at H, okay? And now I start, we start from the root, so I go zero, Yeah, this is, I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion that there's no really easy way to do this. So I go zero, one, one, zero. And so I hit that I, so I write, I go and look at these guys and I write I down. So, that, so I go, aha, message is, ah, is high, okay? So that's how you use these things, okay? And you just repeat this for thousands and thousands of characters and, this, and the savings start adding up, okay? So... How do I do this for like something though, like Gatsby, where he, it's the let where I'm just dealing with the letter A a whole bunch of times. Um, I'm sorry, but without any ease. Um, well, what we have to do is we have to basically 
build this table. We have to figure out what the frequency of all these tables, of, of all these characters are. Okay, uh, and we do this by building a Huffman tree. Okay, so what we do is that we, and it looks a bit weird, but basically um, we take an array of, we basically uh, essentially create a tree out of nodes. And the nodes essentially they'll have a weight, which is how often the character appears, right, the frequency of it, and then the symbol. Uh, all your leaves have symbols, all your internal nodes, they're not going to have symbols at all, okay? Um, so say we're dealing with a custom, um, sorry, with a, so here's the way it works. We use a priority queue to build this, okay? And we store each of the symbols and the weights in the priority queue. And everything's ordered by basically how frequent it is. So say we get uh, we get us we do a we get, we get a document, not a very exciting document, okay? Um, but we get that we get a document and we count up all the characters in the document, and we find that the document has 13 Bs, uh, 22 Cs, 32 Ds, 64 As, and then 104 Bs. Uh, not the most exciting document in the world, I will grant you. Okay. Okay. So the way that that we build the Huffman tree is as follows: we DQ, we DQ from the priority queue twice. Okay. So we DQ uh, B and C. Okay. And we make them children of their own of their own uh, of a new root. Okay. So we basically DQ B and we DQ C. We put the first one on the left first, and the second one on the right, and then we create a new uh, a new node that has their combined weight in it, right? Because this new node is this new root for them. It let's call it BC, right? Because it's both B and C. It's their combined weight, and it has a combined weight of 35 because there's 13 Bs and 22 Cs. Then we reinsert that into the priority queue. Now, because it's a priority queue, it doesn't just go on to the end. It gets reinserted into the plates into the appropriate plates. So since it's 35, it goes second. It doesn't go to the front because 32 because because it's in the queue. It goes to the back first off. But more importantly, it goes here because 35 is bigger than 32, so it doesn't go to the front either. Okay, and then we just repeat until there's only one item left in the tree. So um, so here we DQ. Uh, 32 and 35, right? Put 32 to the left and 35 to the right, and you have a. And so now we've got this tree which is, represents both B, B, and C. Right? Notice that 67 is 32 plus 35, and 35 is 13 plus 22. Right? So then we repeat. We DQ again. Um, 64 and 67, and those get combined. In, so A goes to the right, and the older tree, and the other tree goes to the left. So sorry. It goes to the left, other tree goes to the right. I don't know why I get my right and left confused. Just me and my family. Um, so, um, so then we reinsert this one with the combined weight of 131, and then we just continue for the last one, which kind of is self explanatory how to do that. Um, and what we get is this, and when we look at that, we get a tree where basically E is the most common character, so it's just a single zero. So then uh, an A is a one zero. A D is a one one zero. A B is a one 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 zero, and a C is four ones in a row. So B and C are four characters. That makes sense because they appear pretty much four times less. Sorry, they appear like uh, you know, they appear a quarter of the time that E does. So it makes sense that they cost four times as much. Right. So that's pretty nice. Um, so the algorithm is consider, construct a, su a set of trees with root nodes that contain each of the individual symbols and nodes. Put all those trees into a priority queue, and basically, I mean, these are more individual nodes than trees, right? So then basically, every time we have, while the priority queue has more than one node in it, remove two of the items, put one node back in that has, as its children, the original two items we took off. So how, so let's go ahead and um, so so it's important to know. How I know that because I well.
first off, it was on the final the last couple of times that uh, Professor Korsh wrote, wrote the final. Um, and then I furthermore note, know that's going to be on the final because I think I'm writing the final this time around. So if I say that it's on the final, it's probably going to be on the final. Um, you know, so that's worth knowing. I don't know if this was meant to be used for that, but it's effective. <laughs> and it was in the drawer. So, you know, and this wasn't working. So, I mean, it, it was really bad. It's like, you see what's going on over here. I don't know what happened. Like, somebody tried to put a permanent marker on here. It is terrible. Utterly awful. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, let's go ahead and see. Do I have anything here that I can write on finally? Man, it will have to do. But that's why it wasn't sticking earlier. It was just... Right fine over here, over here, not so much. <laughs> okay, so we'll have to do the best we can. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'll cut through from here. And because this would be less likely to be contaminated. Okay. So let's learn. So we've got 15 minutes left. We'll use that to the remaining amount of time to basically. Uh, go over how to build these things. Projector picture. So say I've got a document that has uh, let's see B worthlessness square. Okay. Okay. Um, you've got B, A, N, and Q as our characters. Okay. Okay. So. E, A, N, and Q because, you know, it's like traditional in math and CS5 we use Qs for some reason. So, uh, say we've seen 100 Bs, uh, 22 As, 50 Ns, and 3 Qs, okay? Okay, this one won't be too hard. So, first thing we need to do is reorder them, okay, in a priority queue. So, we need to, let's see. See, so the first thing we need to do is take Q and move that to the front. So Q is three, B should be last. Yeah, that was easier than I thought to re to sort those. Okay, so okay, so now we've got it in order as a priority Q. So first thing we need to do, so the algorithm is while there's more than one, while there's still stuff in here, we need to DQ two things and then and then combine them. So we're DQing Q and A. So Q goes to the so we're going to create a new tree. Q goes to the right, so to the left. A goes to the right. They had uh, so two over here, three, three and twenty-two, right? So their combined weight is what? Twenty-five, right? So now we reinsert that into the tree. That's twenty-five right here, and I'll just put over here that it was Q and A, right? Okay. So now I'm just going to keep drawing the tree over. Okay, so 25 over here. So 25 and 50, we DQ both of those. So this will go on to the left, and this will go to the right. So um, 50 over here. So that would be N, it had a weight of 50. So this was 25, this is 50. The combined weight is 75. So we reinsert this back into the queue, and it reorders this guy into the front because it's wider than, than that. So we've got 75 and B over here. So again, same thing. This will go to the right over here. So um, this was a B. Okay, so we have a zero, and this had the, this final thing would have the sign of one. We reinsert it back into the queue, and it would be the only thing. So zero, well, we put zeros on the left branches and ones on the right branches, okay? Um, now, the interesting, so now here's the question, how would I, now this is actually really nice. Uh, I chose the ratios I did because that's kind of the ideal ratios for this problem, right? Where basically characters appear twice as often as the other characters. And that would, so basically every time you go, in a you go down the tree, 
you're getting the characters that appear half as often. Okay. Okay. So how would I encode the message banana? Okay. So, well, these are ones. So I so for e a n a n a. Right. The problem with spelling banana is not is not remembering how to spell banana, but remembering how to stop spelling banana. So um, banana is spelled. So we've got a b. Just you which we use the combination one. A is zero zero one, so zero zero one. N is zero one. A is zero zero one. Zero one zero zero one. So we would, if we want to send the message banana, we spend one zero zero one zero one zero zero one zero one zero zero one. Okay, and that, then they would use this tree to decode it. We'd also have to send the tree along. Say, hey, this is the Huffman tree. Right, so there's overhead to knowing basically, hey, this is what kind of file this is, and how do I decode this? Because you can't just telepathically know what the tree is. Yes. How do I search for B? Like, what do you mean B? Like, how do I search for it? Like, to know it exists. Um. Oh, know how to. Uh, well, you because because by generating this tree, you're also getting this table. Um, as well, right? By generating the tree, you also have to. Um, well, so you get this table, and you also create this table, this as well. Yes. So, like first you create the array. Yep. Yep, and then you create the tree, and then as you're creating the tree, you'll basically be building this. Um, this. This. So, that's pretty late, right? We did a lot of work today. Okay, so next Tuesday, I will go over a lot more of this. A bit more detail, give you some harder problems on it. And then we'll get to start on hash tables. My favorite part of this, because they answer the question, a very important question, uh, can we do better than log n? And the answer is what's better than log n? Constant time. So that means can we write something that has constant time and <coughs> and search? And the answer is yes, if we cheat.